In 2014, milk truck drivers for Oakhurst Dairy brought a huge lawsuit against the dairy regarding overtime pay. The drivers argued that according to the overtime laws in the state of Maine, where the dairy was based, they were owed millions in compensation for their overtime work. We'll get to the final cost of the punctuation and grammatical issues later. First, we have to unpack why this even happened. This case went to court, and the decision came down to the interpretation of this single sentence in the overtime laws for the state of Maine, which states that workers are not entitled to overtime pay for the following. The canning, processing, preserving, freezing, drying, marketing, storing, packing for shipment or distribution of 1. Agricultural produce 2. Meat and fish products and 3. Perishable foods Three issues were raised in this lawsuit regarding this one sentence. In jargony terms, what we've got to examine here are the serial comma, or lack thereof, faulty parallelism, and a syndeton. If none of that makes any sense to you, don't worry. We're going to unpack everything and see how these three concepts were the keys to this unusual court case, and how this lawsuit resulted in the most expensive comma of all time. Let's work our way through these three concepts. We'll begin with the one most likely to start an internet fight, the serial comma. Ah, uh, the serial comma, the subject of much debate. A serial comma isn't quite the same as your regular old comma. Yes, it looks exactly the same and is used by pressing the same key on your keyboard. What makes a comma serial or not is its position. A serial comma is a comma that is used before the last item in a list. For example, if you're texting someone a list of things you need them to buy at the grocery store, you might write, can you buy eggs, milk, butter, and coffee? The comma before and in this short message is the serial comma. The commas after eggs and milk are not serial commas. They're your standard, basic, middle of the list commas. That sentence without the serial comma looks like this. Can you buy eggs, milk, butter, and coffee? It's pretty straightforward, right? Given the context, we recognize that this is a simple shopping list, and we can understand that butter and coffee are separate items, not a unit or a specific product. But let's look at a different example that may help illustrate why there's so much debate about this comma. Not including a comma before the last item in a list may suggest that the last two items are actually a kind of unit. Sometimes it's important to indicate units in our list, like in this example. Our company has many departments, sales, research and design, marketing, and content. This example uses the serial comma. Notice that there's one item in the list with an and in it. There's no comma between research and design, which shows us that this department is a unit. Research and design are not separate departments. This sentence expresses four separate departments. Let's remove the serial comma. This sentence runs the risk of suggesting that marketing and content is a single unit, one department. In fact, these departments are separate. This is the kind of issue the serial comma seeks to resolve. Hey, wouldn't you know it's not a single unit because there's no and or or before it? Yes, I'll get to that. Just stick around for part three, which is going to look at this interesting stylistic choice as it helped determine this court case. What makes things especially complicated with the serial comma is that some publications specifically choose not to use it, and others specifically choose to use it. For example, many news outlets, like newspapers and magazines, specifically do not use the serial comma. Many book publishers and academic texts, however, do use it. As a result of these different style guidelines, this end of list comma is not used everywhere, and lots of people have fierce opinions about whether to use it or not use it. Personally, I am extremely in favor of the serial comma. I love it and I always use it. But anyway, let's apply the serial comma knowledge to the sentence this court case centered upon. According to Maine state law regarding perishable goods, workers were not entitled to overtime pay for the canning, processing, preserving, freezing, drying, marketing, storing, packing for shipment or distribution of. So we've got a big list of actions here, and they're separated by commas. The last comma is before packing. The drivers who brought this lawsuit against the dairy argued that packing for shipment or distribution was understood as one task or type of work, packing. The dairy, on the other hand, argued that this was simply a sentence in which the serial comma had not been applied, and packing for shipment, comma, or distribution of was the correct interpretation, two separate actions. The drivers in charge of distribution of the product by delivering it to customers 
argued that because there was no serial comma, only packing was mentioned as being exempt from overtime pay. Therefore, they were entitled to a massive amount of overtime compensation because they were distributing the product, not packing it. The dairy's legal team fought back against this argument, suggesting that from the context, it should be understood that although no comma was used to distinguish packing for shipment from distribution, the two actions were indeed separate. This rebuttal prompted an even deeper dive into some of the unusual grammatical characteristics of this particular sentence, which takes us into part two, faulty parallelism. Let's unravel this weird bit of grammar jargon. Faulty refers to something being wrong or broken. Parallelism refers to the state of being parallel or coordinating in some way. To break this down, many of us learned in grade school that when two objects are parallel, the distance between them is the same at all points. In this sense, they are acting in a kind of coordination. In a linguistic sense, when a construction is parallel, it refers to coordination in terms of grammatical structure or syntax. Just as lines are parallel when they maintain the same distance from one another, language constructions are parallel when they all use the same structure structure, as in the list we talked about earlier. Can you buy eggs, milk, butter, and coffee? All of the items in this list are nouns. They are syntactically the same, and they are therefore parallel. When an item breaks the established structure in some way, the construction is no longer parallel, like this. I like hiking, climbing, listening to music, and to take pictures in the city. Here, we've got an established structure with gerunds, verbs turned into nouns using the ing verb form. However, the last item in the list breaks this structure with to take pictures in the city. This uses the infinitive to take and makes the sentence sound weird because all the items in the list are no longer parallel. Fixing this would be simple. We'd just change to take to taking. This error is an example of faulty parallelism, the same issue seen in the case. The issue in the lawsuit relates to the break in the established parallel structure. The drivers argued the change in grammar constituted a meaningful difference in interpretation. The structure established here uses a series of gerunds, eight of them, to describe the actions exempt from overtime pay. Packing is the last one. The structure then shifts to shipment, a standard noun, not a gerund, and distribution, also not a gerund. The drivers argued that this was yet more evidence that packing for shipment and distribution was meant to be understood as a single unit. If these were to be understood as two separate actions, why not write the law as packing, shipping, or distributing? Why not maintain the existing structure? This break in parallel structure was used by the legal team for the drivers as supporting evidence for their claim that driving, aka distribution in this sentence, was not specifically included in the list of exemptions for overtime pay. But this was not the final piece of supporting grammatical evidence. Part 3. Ascendatin. Ascendatin is the omission of conjunctions from the parts of a sentence. Reminder, conjunctions are these connecting words like and, but, or, for, so. The word comes from the Greek ascenditos, meaning unconnected. It's a stylistic choice. For example, in I came, I saw, I conquered, there is no conjunction. If we wrote I came, I saw, and I conquered, it just wouldn't be the same, right? Use of ascenditin is for emphasis, for rhythm in a sentence, basically a choice on the part of a writer. We see it in The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. This famous passage from Charles Dickens just wouldn't be the same if we stuck an and between each of these things, would it? The same literary device provided the last piece of supporting evidence in this case. The final bit of defense the legal team for the dairy raised was that if indeed packing for shipment or distribution of was the last item in the list of actions exempt from the overtime law, it should surely have been preceded by and or perhaps even or. The legal team for the truck drivers countered with the ascendatin argument, stating that the conjunction had simply been left out of the sentence for stylistic purposes. A bold, daring, calculated move indeed. See what I did there? <laughs> Regardless, let's get to the exciting bit, the verdict. This case got a lot of coverage at the time. It was covered by the New York Times, the New Yorker, and other major media outlets due to its unusual focus on grammar and punctuation. Incredibly, the judge in the case was also persuaded by these linguistic arguments and ultimately ruled in favor of the drivers seeking overtime pay. The final amount awarded to the drivers? $5 million. 
50,000 was provided to each of the five drivers who led the lawsuit, and the remaining money was made available to another 127 drivers who were eligible to file claims for overtime back pay between May 2008 and August 2012. The lawsuit was finally settled in February of 2018, a whole four years after it was filed. While it might seem ludicrous that this trial stemmed from a single missing comma in a legal document, this isn't the only historical case of punctuation or grammar causing massive financial repercussions. In fact, writing for legal documentation requires such an extreme level of care and precision that there are specialist instructors and entire books devoted to the topic. History is full of interesting stories like these. If you like this one, make sure to give the video a like and then check out this other story you might enjoy. And don't forget, keep an eye on your comments.